Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambhudasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambhudasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambhudasa Uram saram gachami Dhamam saram gachami Sangham saram gachami Dutyampi Uram saram gachami Dutyampi Dhamam saranam gachami Dutyampi sanam saranam gachami Tatyampi guram saranam gachami Tatyampi sanam saranam gachami Tatiyati Sangham Saranga Chami. This completes the song for the three we have to do. Panyati Pada Viramani Sagapadam Samadhi Yami. I undertake the precepts to refrain from harming or destroying the living beings. Adina dana Viramani Sakapadam Samadhi Yami. I undertake the precept to refrain from taking that which is not given. Kamesu Michachara Viramani Sakapadam Samadhi Yami. I undertake the precept to refrain from sexual misconduct. Musa Vada Varamini Sakapadam Samadhi Yami. I undertake the precept to refrain from one speech. Sura Mareya Maja Paratana Varamini Sakapadam Samadhi Yami. I undertake the precept to refrain from intoxicants that cause carelessness. I undertake the precept to refrain from sources of livelihood that bring harm to other beings. I undertake the precept to refrain from acting out of ill will or taking satisfaction in the misfortune of others. I undertake the precept to be open-hearted and generous in all my relationships with others. I undertake the precept to act with loving kindness and compassion in all my relationships with others. I undertake the precept to live with mindfulness and follow the Eightfold Path through daily study, meditation, and reflection. With these ten precepts, Virtue becomes the vehicle for a happy existence. Through virtue, good fortune is attained. Virtue is the vehicle for liberation. Let us purify our virtue. This completes the ten precepts. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings be free from ill will. May all beings be filled with loving kindness. May all of these make themselves truly happy. Thank you, thank you, and good evening. Hope you're all doing well. Good meditation. So, uh, you've watched a lot of different sensations over the last few days, right? Observed a lot of different kinds of sensations. Uh, 
I wonder if anyone has anything, any remark to make about sensations. Is there any one thing in particular that you think uh, is characteristic of sensation? Yeah? Uh, all the sensations, none of them stop. None of them stop. Stops. Very good, that's true. It's just continuous. So. Anyone want to add anything to that? They are impermanent, yes. Meaning the sensation stays exactly the same for oh, 10 minutes or so and then it disappears? Uh, changes like 50 times a, a second. Instant by instant, <laughs> that's exactly, yes, yes, yes. That is the characteristic. They are continuously changing. They're non-stop and non-stop changing. And they're, they're never two instants the same in a row. And that's impermanent. What about in terms of things that you have consciousness of or have awareness of? Other than sensations and mental objects, has anybody noticed any other kind of thing that you have awareness of? Other than what? Other than what? Other than uh, mental objects and sensations. By mental objects, I mean things that are known directly to the mind. So other than things that are known directly to the mind, like thoughts and memories and emotions and feelings, is there anything else other than things that are known to the five sense organs? Do you mean bodily sensations? Bodily sensation is a sensation known to sense organs, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Is there absolutely anything at all in, have you discovered, you know, perhaps I didn't, ask the question clearly enough or or set the task clearly enough uh, back when we started but I suggested to you that the only the only things that your conscious existence consisted of were sensations known to the five bodily senses and mental objects known to the mind sense and uh, I'm just wondering if since the time that I suggested that to you if anybody in, in their, your close and careful observation of your experience had discovered that there is anything else at all other than what is known to the five senses and what is known to directly to the mind as a content of the mind. Um, regarding our sense of sight, yeah. the eyes, um, when we open our eyes, you can see many different things. Um, we can see all of them, but if you close, if you close our eyes, um, most of the things that we cannot see, objects. Mm-hmm. This is a wrong kind of view because um, we still can see the lights, mm-hmm. and it's not all the all the all that I want to mention. Uh, when people see darkness, mm-hmm. um, we tend to think that we, we see nothing. But in fact, we really see something. That something is the brightness. Uh, that means that our ability to, to see is uh, independent from our eye, our sense organs. Mm-hmm. That is something happened to all the other uh, four or five sense organs. The ear, for example, when we hear sounds, it is there. But if there's, there's no sound, we often say that we, we hear nothing. But in fact, we are still hearing. The difference lies in the, in the object where Hearing, not the, not the fact that we are not unable to hear anything at all, 
because we're still hearing the silence. Mm-hmm. The sound of silence. The sound of silence. The sound of silence doesn't mean that we can identify the tiny little bit of things that we usually cannot hear. In fact, we, the real empty, the real silence is really a kind of sound at all. Mm-hmm. And the same thing happened to our sense organs. When we touch something, we say we touch the yeah, different se- sensor, s- sensory uh, objects, mm. outer things, and the inner energy floating. But if they all stop, we still have that sense. Mm-hmm. We, we sense the nothing is on the same just now. Mm-hmm. And still, uh, our mental, uh, mental sense, sense organs, the, that is the six uh, sense organs. When the mind comes, you can <coughs> identify them, but it, they never them, none of them stops mm, leaving the empty. Uh, the emptiness of the thoughts in our mind, we can still sense that. So, all, the, all these uh, six sense organs, just like six open windows that let us to penetrate through the inner part of our body in the outer universe. Mm-hmm. That just just uh, six windows. Mm. We, we we do not uh, rely them to to realize the existence of the universe, including the empty side of the, mm, the light and the color of the light, uh, the silence and. The, Different kinds of sounds and the warmth and cold, coldness, or the patterns of a, a touch. Mm. So, in this way, when we are um, observing everything, all things continue to change from emptiness to nothingness to. to some part of suchness. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It sounds like it seems like a mirror that uh, when when the light is in front in the mirror, the mirror does not mm, contaminate by the color. Mm-hmm. When the darkness is reflecting the and the mirror is not like a paint that is uh, that's lost uh, in the mirror. It's not. It's very clean. That nothing can contaminate the mirror at all. Mm, so I think it's permanent, but we are aware of that. Mm, but still, something that is. Is there any, anyone that is observing everything? That's another problem. Mm. How to say that? Mm. Say so the mirror uh, again. The mirror is not independent from the object that the mirror is reflecting. Because as soon as a flower is in front of the, of the mirror. Uh, what is inside the mirror is a flower. Mm-hmm. So they are in actually not different. They're, they are closely related, but, um, but they are the different parts of the same part. Um, so That thing happen outside uh, instantly changes happen inside at all. So it is uh, 
you say one is <laughs> of of ourselves in the outer outer world, but we still aware of that it is here that is observing all the phenomena. Um, the brightness of the the mirror doesn't change at all. Uh, whether it is reflecting the brightness or the darkness, whether it's, it's, it's reflecting the silence or the sound, mm -hmm. the brightness is still is there. So it seems like to describe as uh, stillness that means calmness. Mm -hmm. There's no time when you are observing in the center of the mirror. There's no time at all. But mm -hmm. you stand outside. Oh, that's all. Thank you. Did everyone follow that? Yeah. Um, yeah? We heard uh, many similes using mirrors yeah. to describe emptiness, equanimity, and non-self. She believes she doesn't think it's very it's a very ideal um, simile for for such concepts. Well, every every simile has its uh, uh, problems <coughs> because every metaphor, every analogy, every simile is is uh, an imperfect representation of what you're trying to express through it. So, you know, I, I would agree if you look very closely at the simile of a mirror, um, y you will find some problems with it in one way or another. But um, it, it's also, a, you know, it's pretty good. I don't know if you have a suggestion for one that is better, but there are different ones. But the reason you come across it so often is it's a, it's a way of speaking about it that uh, most people can relate to, and as long as you don't, uh, as as long as you don't compare it to an actual physical mirror too too closely, <laughs> you don't run into. She doesn't think it's ideal because mirror, there is a physical thing yes. associated with it. That's right. The mirror is a physical thing, and the object that's reflected in the mirror is a completely separate physical thing. They're, they're two different physical things. And so therein lies uh, the problem. But what we're what we really, what, thank you, Sean, for for offering that. But the idea is that um, we're we're examining our own experience, and what we want to do is to uh, is to be very uh, very careful and very exact about uh, what we discover. And although we use similes and things like that to help us understand, you know, uh, it's really it's really that which we discover in our direct experience that is going to lead to uh, the, the deeper understanding. The other thing that's very important to do is to be very careful about drawing conclusions, but to rather just keep investigating. Because when we begin to draw, the danger of a simile and the danger of drawing conclusions are the same. That you end up once again, having an intellectual construct, a mental construct, an idea that stands between you and the reality you're trying to observe. So, 
although uh, although we think about and reflect on and do draw conclusions from our observations, we have to be very careful that the conclusions that we draw don't stand in the way of our seeing what it is that we're really trying to see. So that's why I need to always go back over and over again and look. And with any simile, as a matter of fact, if you can see the problems with a simile, then this has helped you to understand more clearly what it is that you were using the simile to describe. Right? So, and of course, what we're trying to discover is the true nature of reality. Yes? Uh, I'm not so exactly understand your question, the, the, the first question, but mm-hmm. I don't know, so I don't know if my answer is answering your question. I, why did the medita- meditation um, besides my mental object and my body uh, sensation, I also, well, something just jumped inside of my mind by, as background or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was like uh, related many years ago or whatever. Um, but why look at that? I, I, I'm always um, different way than before, more um, forgiven, more um, openness, something. Mm-hmm. That's that's very good. Yes. Mm-hmm. Anyone else have any comments? Uh, yes, Ben. Um, well, the first when you asked about whether there's anything beyond other mental formations or, or uh, sensual sensation, mm-hmm. uh, the sensation of the white light with the eyes closed came to mind. But upon thinking about it, I mean, just because your eyes are closed doesn't mean that. You know, regardless of whether your mind is generating this light or whether it's some magical mm-hmm. energy, if, it's, if your mind's generating, then it's a mental formation. That's right. And so, I I can't I can't think of anything beyond <laughs> these two things you mentioned. My point. Thank you. That's uh, uh, that's that's very clear. Yes. And uh, and that. That was my point, is that that's, that's all there is. Well, what about the world of objects? What about the external world of objects? What do you mean by that? Have you, well, the, the things, all of this external world of objects. Here, here's an object. So what's your question? Yeah. Well, can you... How do you know this object? What kind of conscious awareness do you have of this object? You can see it, sense organ. You can touch it, sense organ. Oh, smell it. <laughs> smell it. Burn it. <laughs> Taste it. Taste it. Mm-hmm. But in my experience over this last 30 seconds, I have been conscious of, of image, the image formed on my retina. I've been conscious of the, the, the touch and the taste and the smell. Have I been conscious of a glass of water directly? Or does a glass of water only come into existence in my mind after the touch and after the image. Do I ever really, can I ever really know anything else? I can't. I see that. I feel that. And in my mind, in my mind I have uh, an experience of this, but in my mind, I could, I could uh, have a quite. I could have exactly the same sensations and have a different experience. Because be, uh, it's because we being conditioned this way well, through our senses. 
because it is in fact the only way you know we we assume that the world is the way that that we perceive it in our minds but all that we really know is what things look and feel and, and uh, taste like so this is a, a processions perceptions per- from the mind I mean, because it's the perception yeah yeah that's right concept perception yeah condition mm-hmm we have experience, these experiences we're talking about, they're conscious experiences. And when you're conscious of something, there's an object of consciousness. Right? There's always object. If, if there's no object, then no consciousness. Seems to be the case, doesn't it? And, and of course, uh, if there's an object but no consciousness, you wouldn't know there was an object. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's only when there is uh, a consciousness of an object that there, there, this is the only way we know about things. Right? This is our experience. Our experience is a stream, our flow of consciousness. One object appearing and disappearing after another in the stream of consciousness. And if we look at what's happening as, as you have been. Uh, the, you know, if I don't look at this, the sensation appears in consciousness first. So there is a, 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 the sensation is an object of consciousness. And then following that, a concept of that identifies for us what the sensation is produced by is an object of consciousness. And so, uh, and what we've said about sensation is that it's constantly changing. There is no permanence in sensation. The illusion of permanence is in the perception of objects that's generated by our minds. And if you have a completely new perception or a, uh, a completely new sensory experience that you don't have a concept to put with it, um, you may have had that experience that uh, you see something, but you can't figure it out, figure out what it is that you're seeing. You don't recognize it. And you might feel your mind trying to trying all kinds of different things to identify what it is that you're looking at. Sometimes this happens in dim light or at night or something like that where you can't see detail. So all your mind, all, all your eye can uh, can see and you can you know you, you're completely aware of what your eye is seeing. You see every detail of it, but your mind can't recognize it, can't put a label on it, can't put a concept on it. Or sometimes too, you'll hear a sound and you can't identify that sound. And you find your mind struggling to, you know, experimenting with different concepts to see if any of those concepts fit that sound. And this makes, when this happens, this makes it, it makes us very aware of what's happening all the time, very, very quickly. So the world that we're living in, each of us individually is a world in our mind that Appears to be, it appears to consist of stable objects like this. This glass, sure, it appears to be a, a, a substantial and enduring object, right? And, and I'll point out to you too that when you look away, you, your mind makes the assumption that that object is still there, exactly the same way. And you look, and there it is. You'd be very surprised if you looked back and it was gone, right? <laughs> so, you can see, uh, you, you can understand that 
the world of your experience is created by your mind to explain the sensations that you have. And indeed, it does correspond to something. But uh, do we... Is this glass really the way that we perceive it to be? It's that means uh, if we, I see that a cup of water, mm-hmm. uh, and then I tell you that is a cup of water. Mm-hmm. But what I, I'm telling you is not because of that that water in your hand. It's, it's because the image in mm-hmm. my mind, and I, I match with mm-hmm. uh, my uh, judgment. Right. And then I tell you that is a cup of water. That's right. It's not yeah. because of the Yeah. And, and to you, it's a, a cup of water. To somebody from another planet, it wouldn't be a cup of water. Right? They might not. Somebody who's never seen something like this before might have no idea what it was. But, but to you, it's a cup of water. To me, it's a cup of water. Um, can you be certain that the cup of water that I see is the same as the cup of water that you see? No. No. But we've both uh, we've both used the cup or the word cup before to describe different kinds of objects. Uh, and it could be that if I could look at this through your eyes, uh, I'd say, well, that looks more like a, a, a small horse. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, uh, uh, and you, you, but nevertheless, as long as every cup that that you ever looked like uh, uh, looked at had the same characteristics, you'd were you'd, you'd use the word cup, and I'd use the word cup, and we'd feel like we were talking about the same thing. Yes. This reminds me of uh, I think it was Plato, uh, the allegory of the cave, where uh, there, there was this idea. They, they literally believed that there was an essence in everything. Mm-hmm. Says the cup had cupness essence, and the table has table essence, and that is inherently existent in the thing itself. Mm-hmm. That you know that, that there's this world of ideals, and then the world of matter, and they're separate. And so it's just interesting to see from that perspective that there was even a time when people literally believed that, that there was yes, yeah. the, 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 the idea that that cupness has a reality that every real cup is just a crude imitation of it, yeah. right? But, uh, but the idea of cupness, even that, you know, uh, I wouldn't want to do it because it's got water in it, but if we turn it upside down, it loses cupness. It, it loses a very important aspect of cupness. <laughs> <laughs> so... So there's a, an element of uncertainty, and you know, all of your all of your sensations and all of your sense organs are a flow of constantly changing sensation, and your mind is organizing all this information. But there's a certain element of uh, uh, uncertainty as to how accurate their, your mind's representation is of whatever it is that's out there interacting with your sense organs. Uh, and especially there's an uncertainty as to whether the way you perceive it is the same as the way I perceive it. So um, Things are just, in, in, uh, if you're following me in this, things are starting to lose some of the certainty and substantiality that we normally attribute to them. Now, when we're talking about things like this, the, the language that we use and uh, the consistency of the object is such that um, we can acknowledge that there is some uncertainty there. But it seems to have no practical significance because we'll both, we'll all go through our lives using cups and encountering this particular cup and any other one and not have any particular problems because of that. Although I'll point out to you that 
you might find this to be an exquisitely beautiful cup, a desirable cup that inspires greed in your heart. That you'd really like to have a cup like this. Whereas I might look at it and it's actually a revolting cup. It's disgusting, and, you know, right? <laughs> Isn't that like uh, our argument pretty, pretty fruitless and war pretty foolish? <laughs> well, it shows you that as soon as, as soon as you start to apply certain kind of values to your perception, now we, we can both agree that rocks are hard, but uh, the more we move from a very, very simple descriptive domain uh, to, uh, to various kinds of values, we, it can come up very different, yeah. Words and all kinds of things. Yes. <laughs> so, I just, <clears throat> I just want to add that this is Yosa's <coughs> favorite cup, brought all the way from San Jose. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> well I, I, I keep. I offer you my favorite. Cup. I can see why. <laughs> yeah. uh, because this cup is more endurable. Because it's mm-hmm. thick, it's yeah. not easy to broken. <clears throat> Travels well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, it's a, it's a beer. Yeah. Beer. Don't call it ugly. So John And I feel very privileged to. <laughs> I I offer you my personal cup. <laughs> yeah. But. Uh, But it's, it, 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 its beauty or lack thereof or utility or lack thereof uh, is that actually, we could say it's uh, empty of any intrinsic nature of being that way, right? Yeah. We could take some other examples though, you know. Well, All right. And... Uh, Sophia has a question. Yeah. She she said that she uh, she she could uh, understand that uh, uh, this uh, this glass somebody if like it may have a greed. Oh, Anybody who look, looks at this cup would know it's a, a it's a cup with uh, lemon water. If that person doesn't know, people would think he's an idiot. Then I could say, understand that uh, uh, that uh, when she look at the glass, uh, she would not uh, arise uh, the, the greed, or that she can understand that uh, the, the lemon water maybe she doesn't like it, uh, mm-hmm. all this kind of physical stuff. Yeah. But mm-hmm. she just could not understand what you are getting. Wh- what what is your point? <laughs> to say all of this. Okay. Well, I was going to go to an, an, an example that's. This is something very simple, and my, my point was hopefully to show you how your mind is constantly uh, identifying the nature of things, and that I wanted to move from. Well, uh, let us let's just stay with the cup a minute. I was going to move to something else. Let's stay with the cup. If you talk to a physicist and says, "What is this really? Is it?" Is it what it really seems to be? A physicist, a scientist would tell you, this is 99.999% empty space. 
，如果是一个物理物理科学家、啊、看这个杯子，他会跟你说这个是百分之九十九点九的空间。嗯、okay, and he would say, how could it be? My finger won't go through it.、Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the physicist would say, well, your finger is ninety nine point nine 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 percent empty space too. <笑>他会说：“你的手指也是空间。”And so, what's what's true? Solid cup or mostly empty space? Both. <laughs> 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 That's right. That's right. Both wrong. To a dog, is it a <laughs> cup with、uh, lemon and water? No, no, no. Unless it's a really, I don't know. I was going to say smart dog, but not necessarily. <laughs> not necessarily. <laughs> Maybe a dumb dog, but we don't recognize that as a to cup. to、uh, a a human being. If you could bring a human being here from a、uh, hundred thousand years ago and show this to them. Would it be a cup with lemon and water? It would be an amazing thing. <laughs> It's like, oh my goodness! <laughs> of course, they wouldn't know which way it was up, you know, <laughs> or anything else. They would turn it all around. You know that movie、uh, in Africa? The gods must be crazy. The gods must be crazy. That's right.、Yeah. That's right. So. But let me let, let's let's use let's look at some other examples. Here, okay, <clears throat>、um, you might know somebody in your life that、uh, you think they're a a, a a bossy and aggressive and nasty person, not nice to be around, right? But They may have a a child, or、uh, a husband or wife, or a mother, who sees them in a completely different way. Which one? Which is right? Both are right. Both are wrong. Both are wrong. Both are right. <laughs> well, yes, and、uh, you have an idea of who you are yourself. And、uh, your your friends have an idea of who you are. Is it the same? And are different? Do different friends have the same idea of you? They have different ideas of you. What? Different friends have different ideas. Every every single person has a different idea. Only the name is the same. Yeah, <laughs> only the name is the same. So, so your point. The reality has been changed to protect the innocent. It's two different names. But if we all look at it, everyone will say that it's Johnny or Johnny. But there will be no one who will say that it's not. Or maybe it's Johnny or Johnny. But it's not 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 Johnny or Johnny. 就是说，就算是就也是也是人类，直接接，没有这个概念，他没看过这种杯子。因为我们有相对，那可是我们有概念，我们怎么样？我们真的很难脱离这个概念啊。所以要修行。所以我们现我们现我们现在做的一些事情，我们现在做的事情就是要就是要打破这个概念，我们就 free 了。我们现在我们现在有 suffering， 就是因为这些概念。我们贪嗔痴的概念，我们要打可以打，可是看到一个杯子说它不是，说它什么这个概念，是这个杯子不一定啊。比如说，它是像小人，就说它是像小人，对吧？你你穿。
Yes, and that is my point, is that all we really know is our own concepts that are in our mind. That's what we're experiencing, that's what we're interacting with. When you interact with other people, mostly what you're doing is interacting with your own concepts in your mind. You decide, your your mind, I, I shouldn't say you decide, you don't decide, your mind, based on its conditioning, comes up with a a description and an identification of that person and that's that's who you believe that you're interacting with but is that really the case and the point is that that well for you it's real it's that's your reality but for anyone else including that other person their perception of that is completely different so that's one example uh, Another thing is, uh, if you uh, you can imagine some place that uh, is really beautiful, that you really like it, a uh, wonderful place to be that's especially beautiful, maybe just as the sun is setting. Now, if how would you experience that? Imagine, imagine a, a beautiful beach, you know, there's a cliff and there's rocks and there's birds and the sun is setting over the ocean, right, on the beach. And you can see that uh, maybe right now, if you found yourself in that place, you would be very impressed with the uh, beauty of it and it would give you great happiness. But suppose that you had just learned that somebody very, very dear to you had died. How would it appear to you? It's sadness. He's going to think that he's very sad. He's going to, it's, it's, he's going to die. So, it's, the, if you're filled with sadness, you won't even notice the things that are beautiful, and it won't give you. It won't. It, it will. It will seem meaningless. Yes. Uh, one, one, one personal example, maybe some of us can relate to, is when I first arrived here. The you know, in a generic sense, this place is beautiful. You know, there's streams and trees, and but to me, at first, I think because I was having such an internal struggle with this whole practice and. It, it, it didn't. It wasn't that beautiful at first. I mean, you know, it was. It was sort of. It was a foreign place. It was away from home. It was caused anxiety. It caused a sense of uneasiness. Mm-hmm. And now, now it's you know, now it's quite a beautiful place. But <laughs> but, but, it, but you know, the point is, my perception has completely been transformed by mm-hmm. my experience here. And, yeah. And, and all along, it's you know, it's exactly the same place. It's and exactly course, the same place. You know, it's it's in flux, as we know, but but for the most part, it's the same. It's nothing's really changed except maybe a few of the leaves swept away. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. Thank yeah, you. it's the same with me. Yeah, I I think I I I actually like when I was in high school, I came here before. It was actually someone's house, and it was so beautiful, and my perception of it was so beautiful. 
But when I came back on the first day of the last retreat, it was different. It wasn't as beautiful as before, and my perception was different. But as the retreat progressed, it became beautiful again. Mm-hmm. It's not um, possible only because of the, your internal uh, you know, perception, maybe because of the weather. It's getting better. No, maybe, no. you know, it's getting warmer. I mean, you, you should add those kinds. I mean, no, no, I, I realized that, like, as my meditation practice progress, like, my, visually, my perception changes. Mm-hmm. Like, like, when I see the trees, like, like, um, because this happened before when I was doing meditation, when, when I was doing meditation, um, and do, doing yoga, I was doing breathing meditation while I was doing yoga, my perception totally changed. Like, I could see, for some reason, I could see the, the mountains far away. My eyes can zoom in into the mountain and see what's in the mountain, in the hills, you know? And, but then after I didn't practice, it just became the same again. So my perception changes as my meditation um, yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. 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 Like, yes. We, we have the same experience. So. When I first came here, I thought, what a beautiful place this is. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone sat down and said, said, oh, this place is so terrible. I knew it when it was beautiful. It's such a mess now. It's so run down and everything. <laughs> 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 you know, I, it changes. Our perceptions, yeah. things stay the same. Yet our perceptions of them change, and different people have different perceptions of the same thing at the same time. And you know, yeah, I, I have the same experience when I'm back at home. I do better meditation than here. So every time after I come out of my meditation, everything looks beautiful. The color, the shape, you know. So I. So how do things look when you're angry? Pardon, pardon. How is the world when you're angry? Noise. <laughs> yeah, you 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 well, always in the way. You're consumed by your world is that uncomfortable feeling, uncomfortable thought. It's 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 hard to pay attention to. It's hard to feel the mind so with other things. Definitely, your mental state has a tremendous impact on how you how you perceive things to be. It also has a huge impact on on what you see, what you experience. Okay. You get out of bed in the morning and you're filled with greed and you go out into the world, what do you see? Greed. Uh, you just see things you want. <laughs> if the world is consists of two kinds of things. Things I want and things I'm not interested <laughs> But it's also association, right? If you have positive association with something or a place, mm-hmm. um, then you tend to think of it better. Um, and then if you have mm-hmm. negative association to it, then even it could be something good, but you just notice it. It's Absolutely, good. it's an association. And that's, what it gets down to it is the experience that, you're, that you have in any moment has hugely more to do with what's in here than what's out there. That's that's really what it gets down to. If you, I don't know if you had a chance to spend much time observing uh, physical pleasant and unpleasant, and noticing the mind's reaction, the the uh, mental pleasant and unpleasant in response to the same experience. But if you did, you might notice that far more important than the physical pleasantness and unpleasantness is the mind's reaction. Far more important in terms of determining the nature of your experience. It's the mind's reaction that's far more important than the actual sensation itself. Yeah. I was having a, 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 a thought that uh, if, you know, if people watch a lot of TV, they're going to notice a lot of um, a lot of uh, huge companies. They spend 
billions of dollars trying to form people's perception. Mm -hmm. They want make McDonald's this happy, mm -hmm. you know, a place I can go to and have lots of fun, but it, the reality is that people get obese and have all kinds of problems going there. But the thing is, it's a, it's a, it's they're selling, they're, mm -hmm. they're trying to, they're trying to, you know, fool people into the wrong, unhealthy perceptions. Mm -hmm. So are things really what they, the, what they seem, what the way they appear to us to be? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you if you if you think about this and you keep pursuing that, what you might do is you might start to doubt more and more that anything is the way it appears to you to be, because you might start, I, I, I think you would start discovering more and more that that how any particular thing appears to you now is not necessarily how it's going to appear to you another time, depending upon all of the different factors that condition your mind uh, at the moment of having the experience of that thing. And you might come to realize that uh, really no one has the same experience of the same thing. Everyone's experience of everything is different. So then you start to question, does anything ever have, you know, from its own side, a nature of being the way it appears to us to be? No. Just not based on philosophy or a Dharma book that you read or anything else, but based on your own experience. When you really look at your own experience, is it, is it really reasonable to assume that things are self-existently as they appear to you to be? No. Virtually nothing is, no. right? No. Never. <laughs> And what are they dependent upon? What are the factors? Well, your past experience. That's a huge part of it, right? Your past experience. You said your, your associations. Yeah. Your past experience with something similar creates associations which have a, a huge impact on how you experience something. <clears throat> and uh, um, if you... Uh, if you're a junk collector and somebody else is a professional archaeologist, you might encounter, the two of you might encounter a vase at the same time and to you it's another piece of junk and to the archaeologist it's an absolute treasure, you know, 2,000 years old from whatever uh, culture and era and so forth. You know, but... Um, I mean, these are very crude examples, but you, if you go the subtler and subtler levels you go to, you realize more and more that it's your mind, that the, the, the world you live in is created by your mind. And it's not necessarily any particular way. Somebody else is in the same place, same objects, they're having a completely different experience. Somebody, somebody in a different, in, in the same situ a different person in the same situation, uh, thinks, "Oh, how fortunate I am." Whereas the other person says, "Oh, how miserable I am." That happens all the time. That happens all the time. Yeah. Does Does the Dharma emphasize a particular attitude to take towards things, or or is it more uh, importance is the noticing? Well, the noticing is so important because until we really start noticing and paying attention, we believe that we're locked in this prison of our own making, that we believe the world is the way we see it, and it's out there, and it's that way. And we don't really have control over it, you know, and... It's my bad karma that I was born in this terrible situation, right? Or whatever, right? 
So you, you feel the, the noticing is important for you to discover that in fact uh, the world that you're living in is created by your mind. And your experience of it is determined entirely by mental factors. So the, this leads you to the possibility that if you can understand how it is that your mind creates the world, then you can be liberated from that uh, situation of feeling like you're stuck in a world that perhaps you don't like the way it is. And actually we are. We're stuck in a world that we don't like the way it is. We get sick, we get old, we die. People we love die. Things we like wear out and get broken, stolen. Uh, Yeah. I'm wondering if you can relate this to um, to not self, because I know there's a direct relationship. But I, mm-hmm. I really, I was wondering. If, if, I don't want to interrupt your plan, but if, if you if you don't have a firm plan, you, <laughs> <laughs> you they're, they're very very closely related. Because I mean, what we're doing now is is exactly is exactly the same thing. We're looking exactly we're per- perceiving at, the self. at the so, external world the same way we look at this perception. Self, we have. Uh, first of all, we have this idea that we didn't even know we created of who we are. But we looked at that and we began to see that. Well, yeah, that's just a collection of concepts that we carry around, and, and the idea of who we think we are. Well, it turns out the world is the same thing. It's a collection of concepts we have and a whole bunch of ideas about these concepts and judgments and everything else. So it is, it's exactly the same thing. That, and with the... Uh, we, we found that intellectually we could understand that this uh, self that we conceived or see itself as being, that's all, all of these different characteristics, I am this, I'm that, I like this, I, I want that, I don't like that, and everything else. Intellectually, we can, we, when we examine it, we were able to see that uh, it was just a construct, and that, it wasn't, and that it was changing all the time. It wasn't even the same construct all the time, but we didn't even realize it. Now, we're just looking at the rest of the world, Remember the self, you make an imaginary line. What's inside, that's, that's self. What's outside is the rest of the world. So we're looking on the other side of the line, we're finding it's the same thing. Yes. That it's a, it's a collection of concepts and ideas, uh, impressions, feelings, uh, uh, that we, uh, and, and we can examine it, and, and intellectually you can understand that indeed that is the case. That all there really is, is a constant flux of sensations. Our mind attaches ideas, concepts, labels to this, and so we come up with all these objects, and then based on our mental state and our past conditioning and our desires and aversion and everything else, uh, we attach all kinds of values to it. And so we come up with, well, this is my world, made up of these things, and these are the good ones, and these are the lousy ones, and, you know... Right. We're the editors. Right. <laughs> but we, we can see that taking place. But just as with the self, we also discovered that there was still a, a, a sense of self that even, even though we could see beyond the illusion, we still had this sense of self which was responsible for our suffering. Don't you still have, no matter how much you can intellectually understand the emptiness of the world. Uh, and that's what emptiness means. The definition of emptiness is that it is not the way it appears to be. That's what emptiness means. To say that to say that this has the nature of emptiness means that this does not inherently, from its own side, have a nature of being the way I perceive it to be. This perception is taking place in my mind. And I don't even know what it is from its own side. I'll never be able to know. As a matter of fact, 
I see it the way I do because I have one particular kind of eyes. There are other animals with different kind of eyes and they wouldn't even see it the same way. And I feel it the way I do because I have a particular kind of sense organs in my hands. Other beings would not feel it that way. I conceptualize it the way I do, a handy thing to hold water in, you know, nice grip, that other minds would not have those concepts at all. So that's what I mean by empty. This glass and your whole world and the other people, they're all empty of any self-nature of being the way they appear to you to be. And that is absolutely, definitely true. But it still feels like it's feels like it's just the way it looks to me. Right? You have this sense of having a substantial reality of its own, from its own side. Just as you have, even though uh, you realize that everything is in flux and passing away, things seem to have a, a, a quality of permanence to it and enduringness to them. Yep. So, uh, uh, so since uh, we haven't uh, break the concept and the condition, mm-hmm. but intellectually we understand all of this. Yeah. Then there's a gap in between. There is a gap in between, and so how should we deal with it? Well, there's a couple of ways that you can deal with that gap. For one thing is that you can keep on further refining and clarifying your intellectual understanding and satisfying yourself more and more. And in the process of doing that, you can keep that awareness and understanding in mind. You see, the feeling that things are substantially real comes from the, the hab- partly from the habit of always viewing them that way. So we can cultivate a new habit of remembering what we've discovered. But but the other thing is to uh, refine our perception and examine reality in such a way that we can cause the mind to stop creating the reality the way that it does. If you're if you uh, if your mind stops creating this world for even a moment, then in that moment you will know the emptiness of it in a way that you'll never forget. So. But both are important. And, uh, I mean, ultimately, ultimately it's the direct knowledge of reality that comes from uh, the mind stops projecting on reality. But to, to just continue to deepen your understanding and to continue to observe brings you closer and closer to that. And also it's very, very helpful in uh, making your life a whole lot better uh, you know, in the meantime, right from the beginning. Yeah. Um. I um, I saw these formations uh, from my past experience, um, but but they're they're observed through very careful um, mindfulness and not necessarily meditation. So so how come? What's a, it seems like a, a, the wisdom that I acquire mostly has to do with. Uh, being very, very mindful, yes. and then mm-hmm. understanding what causes what. Yes. So why are we focusing on on the tip of the nose all the time? I don't mm-hmm. understand that. How did you How did you come to be so mindful of the things that are going on? Um, I try to. Well, you know, the meditation that I was instructed by another teacher mm-hmm. was uh, was basically. Basically, you sit there and you are extremely mindful of what, of, of what, what you know, how it whatever is, is happening, yeah. whatever is happening, mm-hmm. and then and the natural thing to do is to to understand the cause and effect of mm-hmm. of of, uh, of of these uh, relationships. Isn't that what's happening when you're watching your breath too? Um, 
I, I only today I realized that okay, you know, what you actually want us to primarily focus on on, on the notes. And, and for, for for a long time, I've been just practicing to try to focus on the whole body. Mm -hmm. So so uh, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm not questioning your technique. I just like to no, yeah, and neither of those. It doesn't matter whole body or nose. What it is is it. You're, you are in a state of observation, you're training the mind so that when you're not meditating, you, you, you're much more mindful. So it is to train after the meditation so we can have That's stronger part of awareness. It. That's part of it. The other part of it is to come to the place... I mean, I said there were two things. One is you become, through uh, mindfulness, you observe and you notice and, and you reflect and intellectually your understanding deepens. Through these observations, uh, that's, a, that's a, a deepening intellectual understanding and that's very important. But what you're ultimately after is the circumstance where, and, and this is far more likely to happen in meditation than out, although it could happen outside of meditation, but where your concentration, your mindfulness, your equanimity uh, and your understanding of these things are all lined up. All of the all of the uh, factors of enlightenment are present at the same time. And at that point, your mind is going to cease uh, clinging to nama and rupa. It's going to cease uh, grasping to sensation and generating all these formations as a result of it. And in that moment, you're going to experience the true nature of reality. Your mind's going to turn away from samsara and turn towards nirvana. And in that, in that moment, you know, you, more is going to change than in all of the hundreds and thousands of hours of being mindful of, of your behavior. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe I shouldn't say more is going to change. It's going to change in a more permanent way. I see. It may not be the... the so it's a more piercing that's uh, more, insight. That's a more penetrating, penetrating insight. Penetrating insight. Right. So the meditation is contributing to both. Right. The meditation is giving you the mental clarity and the mindful awareness to examine what's taking place and to reflect on it and to understand it. But it's also taking you to the place where you can have that... Uh, uh, path attainment experience, which uh, will do all of the understanding that you are acquiring through your mindful awareness, uh, you could lose as, as easily, you know? So, so, so the, I just want to make sure I understand this properly. Uh, basically, if I continue with my current practice of just trying to be extremely mindful in my meditation, it's not going to have the have adequate concentration and mindfulness. It's not powerful enough to gain pen, you know very deep penetrating insight. But, yeah, hopefully at, at, at any moment it will be. So so right now I should be focusing on on focusing on observing the tip of the nose because I want to develop a very you want to develop concentration and mindful awareness, but at the same time. I said, this is the vipassana part of samatha vipassana. At the same time, you're observing your mind. You're really, every time you, you try to make your mind do one thing and it does something else, you're observing the way it behaves. You've been doing this. You know what it's like. You, 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 you say, uh, uh, I'm having a good meditation, and then certain kind of thoughts come. And then you recognize that those certain kind of thoughts are arising out of uh, sort of, you know, uh, greed, ill will, whatever it is, and you recognize that. So that gives you some some insight. You see how, uh, by observing your mind while you're meditating, you come to see how all these things are happening all the time. And then you go out in the world and you see, oh yeah, the same thing's happening here. Even though things are happening a lot faster, and it's a lot harder to focus because because you've been seeing how your mind behaves when you're meditating. It's much easier to see how your mind behaves in the world, is it not? Haven't you had that experience? Yes, but here's my question: um, If we're so absorbed in the breath, we don't even know whether it's inhale or exhale already. So how how can how can I in that 
in that point itself, while, while you're so absorbed in the breath you don't know whether it's inhale or exhale, you aren't going to be having any particular insights into the nature of the mind, but you're going to be developing uh, strong powers, uh, you're going to be actually exercising strong powers of concentration that you've developed. You will have joy and happiness arrive, which will become pasadi, which will become tranquility. And the this concentration will greatly lessen the the strength of sense desire and ill will and worry and remorse and doubt and these other hindrances. Uh-huh. Right? So okay. And so as a result of sitting so focused on the inhale and exhale, or, or, or so focused on the breath that you don't even know which is the inhale and which is the exhale, you become a person who has powerful concentration, powerful mindful awareness, uh, a, an, an open, joyful, happy state of mind to explore a reality with, who has a mental peace of mind, who is who, for whom des- the worldly desires and ill will and all the other hindrances are either uh, uh, completely suppressed or, or greatly weakened. So you're in a much greater, uh, much, much better position. Uh, you, you, the idea isn't that you're going to spend all of your time in a state of watching your breath. So there will be less, less dust in, in the eye, therefore, therefore I can probably see reality better and gain deeper mm-hmm. insight. Yeah. So the idea of, of this practice is that you're developing concentration and mindful awareness, and at the same time, you are gaining insight into the way your mind works and the way reality is. As you progress, you develop uh, samatha. So you're developing, uh, on the way to samatha, you're also doing vipassana. But then, if you, if you aren't lucky enough to have already got enlightened before that, <laughs> then you're going to come to a place where your samatha is, is very well developed, and the hindrances are suppressed, and then uh, you probably take up a much more rigorous practice of, of vipassana. As a matter of fact, uh, I see. The, so, uh, the ideal okay. practice of vipassana, as uh-huh. your mind becomes this, the, is what some people call choiceless awareness, uh-huh. or what's also called mahamudra. Your mind can remain still, and you can allow anything to come, just whatever comes up, you allow it to come and pass away, and you just observe it. And, uh, and then this is, a, this is a very powerful way to practice vipassana. And the two go together. As your concentration deepens, you can spend some time practicing the just simply watching, um, simply observing what's happening. And then go back, do more samatha, and deepen it further. I see. I see. Thank you for the clarification. So uh, you do the two together, but also there's a certain point where the samatha is so strong that you switch over and you're, you're doing more vipassana than samatha. I see. I see what your point is. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, I think uh, I understand what uh, you teaching and remind me. Mm-hmm. And it's not... Uh, I the C only is in two steps internal, is it? It's two what? It's uh in two uh all six internal six all um six senses. Six senses. Oh no no, yen shu shu yu eyes, nose, ear, taste, and yes, the yes, those senses, yes. Yeah, you try to teach to die. Um, I think if we want to uh, work in perfect, at least it's mindfulness. The best way is uh, non-self. That's uh, yes. That's well. That's a very, very important part of the way. Both both are 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 both understanding the emptiness of the external world and understanding the emptiness of self are both very helpful. 
but um, the in in terms of which is both most difficult and which is most uh, ultimately most important, it's overcoming the attachment to self. Thank you, Lee. I have a question about self during meditation. Uh, seems like if we are in in Tao or we are sleeping, and the sense of self is is uh, much weak. It's weak. And if I try to uh, bring back uh, attention, mm-hmm. say uh, I need awareness, and the sense of self is stronger. Yeah. So the system that okay, I need to focus now, mm-hmm. and the sense of me mm-hmm. have to be stronger in order to I need aware. So how is that the, the concept self is during the meditation? You're saying that the sense of me has to be stronger? In order to be aware of uh, the sleepiness of the... Well, it doesn't, uh, I, I, I disagree. I don't think the sense of self has to be stronger. I think what you need to notice is that often there is no sense of self. You know, when you're in a state of very strong awareness, there is no sense of self. There is no... And this is a very important thing, that to be aware of those times and those experiences where the distinction between the, uh, that which, of which you are, are, are conscious doesn't really, there, there is no sense of a separate seer or knower or thinker. It's just the experience. This, this is one of the things that uh, you should come to see very clearly is that there, although often often we have this idea of the I, the self, and we uh, expect to find when we're seeing, we expect there to be a seer that's doing the seeing, and we expect to, there to be a thinker behind the thinking. But if when we start paying attention, we find ourselves just seeing, and there's no seer there unless we, uh, you know, uh, we actually turn the mind to the idea of the self. But in the experience of seeing, there's just the seeing. In the walking, there's just the walking. In the seeing, there's just the seeing. In the hearing, there's just the hearing. And that other times, other times our mind turns to this idea of self, and, and then that's the object of our consciousness, and that's what we perceive, and that's what we feel. But that it's, it's profoundly important to have this realization that that's not always there, that it doesn't have to be there. And then when it is there, it's actually a separate awareness. The, the idea of the self, the concept of the self, is a, 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 just that, it's a concept. And we take it. But likewise, the feeling of a self, it's just, it's a feeling. It's a separate thing, too, that we can take as object. But if we are truly engaged with the consciousness of something else, there is no seer or hearer or feeler in there. It's only, you know, we have to let go, uh, we have to momentarily let go of the seeing in order to go to the place of feeling like the, there's a self there. Consciousness takes the form of whatever it is that it's holding, just as Sean was saying, you know, that in the mirror there's a flower in front of the mirror and the flower is, is in the mirror. When you're, when you're seeing, consciousness takes the form of the seeing and the visual object. But then, and, and there is no self in that. There's only, there's only the visual object. But then you, you will, in the next moment, you can, can say, oh, well, I'm the seer. And then what you do is you look, and, and sure enough, you'll find that feeling of selfness in there. I understand that. And just, it's just a feeling of uh, somebody is looking at, uh, aware of something, aware of the grass. I know it's a wrong view about me or I is aware, but just feel stronger when when I concentrate. 
Mm-hmm. And I feel strong as of something or somebody yeah. is watching this kind of thing. Yeah. Right. We well, feel strong awareness, but you know, and, and that's that's what you want to do. And, but you want to notice that, as a matter of fact, in the meditation, where you become aware of this is that uh, you have strong awareness, and then then there will this be this I- idea of uh, I'm doing this, or uh, I, I I want this to happen in a particular way, or you know, and then the, you can actually see this whole selfness move in as a separate process. So question. Can, I, can I add on to that? Maybe if it, maybe it's off topic, but his question reminds me of uh, in my meditation I feel very it's very useful to think about a doer and a knower. Mm-hmm. And the doer is always in the way like yes. like we just just said a knower is someone I want to give more energy to so that this knower can yeah. observe, can can mm-hmm. just observe and see. So yeah. th- does that um, fit in what you just said? It, it it does fit in as long as you know. I mean, if you're uh, maybe if you said it's just the knowing and the doer gets in the way of the knowing. Uh, but it's a, that's another thing to look at. Let's look at the doer part of it. We haven't really said much about that. The doer part. Of it. That's a lot of our sense of identity, isn't it? You feel. I, I am doing, I am deciding, uh, I want, I, I choose. And that's a lot of the sense of self is in that active part there. But uh, I, I would invite you to look very closely at that. And what you'll find is that, uh, you know, let's call this intention. The doer uh, ultimately... Uh, all of the doing comes down to the arising of an intention in the mind. So you have an intention to do one thing rather than another. You know, you're, uh, you notice that uh, your mind has wandered and there comes the intention to bring the uh, mind back to the meditation object. Where does the intention come from? Well, it, it's in it's in the same way the intention arises out of that same collection of uh, mental uh, formations that you brought to that moment already. Uh, when we make decisions, many many of the things that we would say, "Well, I decided this," actually. There wasn't really any choice. Our pre, our previous conditioning and preferences, and experiences had already determined which way the decision was going to go. Sometimes when we find ourselves uh, trying to make up our mind, don't you find an impulse to do one arises with its argument and justification, and then an impulse to do the other arises, and and they go back and forth. But eventually, one or the other turns out to be stronger. But those things, it feels as though there's a self doing it. But if you pay more attention, it's more like there's a watcher watching the mind do it. (coughs) Um, We condition. This is uh, this is so important to understand that we accumulate conditioning that results in the decision to act in certain ways. And what you do in this moment is actually the result of the ways that you've conditioned yourself previously. When, when you make a choice, it's, it's the previous, various different kinds of previous conditioning, some of them in opposition to each other, but then they sort themselves out and one side or the other wins and, and, and a decision is made, or a particular intention arises. So uh, we're constantly both manifesting the results of the previous conditioning of our mind and the present moment 
is creating the uh, future conditioning of our mind. Then I have a question. When we make a choice, yeah. that means we, we have a many different things for us to choose. Mm-hmm. So uh, each situation has lots of condition. That's right. Right? So who determine the, the, the choice, uh, which one should happen? But that, that's the sense of self, that I'm yeah. making the choice. Yeah, you have the sense of self that you are, but what you're doing is you're watching several different mental processes yes. uh, struggle with each other, yeah. and then uh, the majority wins at some point. <laughs> so, so you think it's only the majority win. Mm-hmm. There's no sense of self. So this choice made by itself. That's right. In a, in, in that sense, the the choice is made. The choice makes itself. Yeah. There's a, nobody making that choice. There's nobody making that choice. Well, actually, there's somebody making that choice, but it's not an existent self that's present in the moment. The somebody who made the choice is the stream of consciousness that led up to that moment where uh, where uh, other things created the conditions for that. Now, I... Okay, there are choices. The choices are... You see, in your mind, if you absolutely hate this and love this, uh, you cannot make a decision of which one you're going to, to take, right? Because the answer is always are already there. The only time a decision, a true decision is possible is when all the influences in your mind add up to 50-50, exactly. Yeah, yeah, even. Yeah, that's, right. that's the only time. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Or when there's no opposition. So how do you come to practice Dharma? For example, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, it's not a a, a part, uh, you you don't decide to be virtuous uh, because uh, you make a decision in the moment to be virtuous. In the past, you made decisions where there was nothing opposing that to acquire understanding and to acquire uh, uh, patterns of behavior so that when you come to the present moment and there is the the situation present where uh, there's the potential for a virtuous or non-virtuous act, act, you've already created the conditions. Okay? Now, if those conditions are in perfect balance so that, you know, yes or no is 50-50, then you could say that there's really a decision taking place. But uh, unless that's the case, it's going to go one way or the other just based on on the way that you already conditioned your mind in the past. But, and this is where the power of mindfulness comes into it, because if you can see yourself, and you can see yourself, you can see the decision being made by your mind, and the non-virtuous action being performed, and your mindfulness also observes the consequences. Now that's going to affect next time. Next time you come to that same point, instead of there being uh, a a predominance of conditioning to commit the non-virtuous act, there is now the new conditioning of the mind that that came from the mindful observation. And that's going to bring it to a situation First of all, brings it to a situation where it might be 50-50 and you can go the right way, but with any luck, you come to that situation in the future, and now the stronger condition is in favor of the virtuous action and not the non-virtuous action. What about if the, the choice is nothing to do with right or wrong, virtual or non-virtual, you know, evil or good, you know? What about that kind of uh, decision? All these, all decisions are the same. They're all going to be the result, the cumulative result of your past conditioning. 
Now, every decision that you make is going to be a cumulative result of your past condition. But the nice thing is there are situations, you know, here we have a situation where there's a, a, a choice between a virtuous and a non-virtuous action. Right? But there was a time in the past where there was no question of virtue or non-virtue. There was something completely different that there was some Dharma teaching that you found interesting. And because your mind was conditioned to want to pursue that which it found interesting, you went and got a Dharma teaching. As a result of the Dharma teaching, then later on, when you come to the virtuous, non-virtuous situation, you have the conditioning that came from the Dharma teaching, which didn't have anything to do originally with virtuous, non-virtuous, but it becomes a part of it. So, uh, I don't know who was... <laughs> you already all these hands the going back... My for, dual uh, question was hijacked. Can I go back to the dual question? To which question? Oh, go, go, ahead. Uh, go, go ahead. Can I ask a question before she asks a question? <laughs> no, 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 please do, do the dual question. Please. <laughs> Quick. If I understood what, understand what you said, are you saying during the meditation there is a role for a doer? Is that what you I'm not no, saying that. I'm saying that, that the idea of the doer as a, as a self is always an illusion. So you're okay. saying the, the separation of doer and the knower is just a convenience? The, the, the separation, well, it's, it's uh, more than just a convenience, it's very functional. Yeah, a, a functional uh, convenience. And that's why, you know, in, in meditation I keep trying to, st- to stress that you're, condi- you're training the mind, you're conditioning the mind, you're creating the conditions for the meditative state to arise. You know, you're creating the conditions for the uh, for the attention to cease wandering. But, but, is the but you doer? can't you can't stop mind wandering. The doer is a, a figment of your imagination. The doer can never stop mind wandering. But the doer is the one caused mind wandering. So if the doer is gone, there is no mind wandering. Well, and then I'm uh, I don't. You find that you find that. I, maybe we're not talking about the same thing. Like when your mind wanders, do you decide to mind wander? Well, I didn't. But there is a doer who is doing it. I mean, as a as a. I don't know. It seems, it seems to me it, it just happens that first you were on the meditation object, then your mind was wandering. Then, you, and not only that, then your mind was wandering, and then suddenly you knew it. It was there wasn't a doer that. Um, caused the realization that mind wandering had occurred either. But I would like to think about the mind having different functions, different mm-hmm. parts, and uh, um, yeah. one portion probably is more responsible for doing stuff, and the other is more passive and observing. Yes. And uh, why mind wandering is because you're giving more energy to the to the part that is doing. So if there is. Um. Okay, that's. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand. You, you have that's it, you why, have. That's, no, Jack, in Jackie's question, he said, when, maybe I, if I understand mm-hmm. correctly, um, when I'm about to fall asleep, when I'm very drunk, mm-hmm. both knower and the doer, my mind is very low energy. At that that's right, the so energy the level. Is low is energy, knower mm-hmm. is low energy. Right. But somehow, if I can just give a little bit of energy to the knower at that point, my, my meditation goes very well. Yes, you, well, you give energy to your mind, and you do that by, by, yes, you do that by knowing and doing exactly. In the in the in the context of the meditation, first you can turn your attention to the meditation object and know it more clearly, and that will energize the mind. Or you can turn your attention to paying attention to sounds or opening your eyes, and all of these knowings will energize the mind. And also, through doing, you can energize your mind through through doing. I agree with that entirely. Okay? Um, So, 
where, where I was coming from is the sense of this doer as being a self and, and being in control rather than being a process of the mind. It's a process of it, it is a process. The watcher is a process of the mind. Right. All the different watchers are processes of minds, and all the different right. doers are processes and of the mind. They're not encouraging the right. The, and they're not. They're not. They're not a self. No, no, no. They they are processes, but as processes, they are real and they're functional and, and they're useful. Yes, and sometimes, uh, sometimes you have to. Uh, in order to create the proper conditions, the doer has to stop doing. Yeah, I agree with you completely. Yeah, okay. So I apologize for that earlier. I thought she was going to change the entire topic, and I, I'm going to forget about what I asked. I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, well. yeah, uh, my question back to her related to her question. She was asking about the the free choice, uh, I, and then I'm thinking. Since we are conditioned by our previous karma, mm-hmm. so do we really have free choice? Well, uh, the, the, there is a sense at free choice that we do not have, and that's uh, that's the idea that we could actually at any time to decide to do anything we want, and that's not true. Um, because our, our karma, our previous conditioning, uh, uh, tremendously reduces the amount of free choice that we really have. But it is not to say that we have absolutely no free choice. Because and as I was saying, there are all of those... Uh, Any time there's a situation where the conditioning is balanced, you know, if you're at a decision point, and it could go either way, equally. At that point... There is free choice, and those, in terms of the functioning of the mind, there's many, many of those points that arise constantly, and so there is the possibility for free, free choice, woven into our experience, but that's woven in amongst all of our conditioning, and the weight of our conditioning basically drives what happens in our life. That, that thread of free choice that is woven in is what makes it possible to change. Otherwise, if it wasn't for that thread of free choice, everything would be determined and nothing could be changed. You know, it would be totally determined. There would be no hope. There would be no point in practicing. I mean, either you have the karma to become enlightened or you don't, so there's no point in trying to do anything. But in fact... That's a that's a, a choice, and you can only make that choice if you if all of your conditioning is such that it's not going to push you either towards uh, uh, you know making the choice to just do nothing, or else making the choice that, that uh, or, or going in the direction of uh, practicing the dharma because it doesn't seem to you reasonable not to. So we do have, there, we have free will in a limited sense, in in a state, in a state of, of conditioning. So important to take responsibility and control of our conditioning, and that's what we're always doing: uh, is reconditioning ourselves. Um, if you're familiar with the the uh, description of what makes up an individual. Make, makes you up as an individual of five skandhas, five heaps. There is uh, rupa, which often is described as materiality, but if you think about what we've discussed, rupa is sensation. Okay. And there's consciousness. And consciousness takes the sensation as object, and as a result there's a perception. But that perception is determined, as we were also talking about, by all of our mental conditioning. So there's the mental formations. We have this huge mass of mental formations that we've accumulated over our lifetime, or perhaps through many lifetimes. But definitely, you have this mass of 
mental conditioning, mental formations, concepts, preferences, past experience that is there. And when your consciousness takes an object, the the nature of the perception you have is going to be determined by that collection of mental formations. Okay, the other, the other, the fifth component is the feeling of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral that's associated with it. Now, in in every experience you have, you know, one conscious event after another, all five of these are present. So consciousness takes the object, there's feeling associated, there's a perception determined by the mental formations. And then as a result of the mental formations that were already there, and that feeling of pleasant and unpleasant and the arising of uh, desire uh, or aversion, a new kind of, a, there, there is in that moment a new action or intention that arises. That's a new mental formation, a volitional formation. That, now all of these things are added to the collection of mental formations that you already had. So you now have a new perception. Perhaps the object of consciousness was something that you had experienced before. Now your perce- your future perceptions are going to be determined not just by your previous experience of that object, but now by this current experience of it as well and the pleasure and the pain associated with it, and also the desire or aversion that arose and the intentions and the actions that arose out of it. So something came up, you reacted with aversion, uh, you got angry. Everything that happened in that moment now is added to the mental formations. It's added to the conditioning. So in the future, when in, in some future moment of consciousness, when you encounter the same object and you experience it again, it's conditioned by that. So this is always taking place. Now in in each of these moments, the, the key thing that is, is that volitional formation, that intention that arises. And often your past conditioning is so strong that the, the volitional formation, the intention and the action really, you're, you're going to act in a particular way because your conditioning is too strong. The, the lust or the greed or the hatred or whatever it is, you know, there, there's not going to be the option for a decision to change. But the free will happens. The freedom to change the course of your karma and to change the course of your life is that whenever in one of those moments that volitional formation can go in a positive way creating a uh, positive kind of conditioning rather than a negative way, creating negative conditioning. This is where you create your karma. And of course it becomes a part of of the total conditioning. So, the meditation, actually we are using the awareness, which is a function of the mind, to condition our mind. Absolutely. And uh, Mm -hmm. uh, we, we try to condition uh, we try to condition a condition. It's not uh, we normally uh, function. Normally, uh, to go to angry. We just go to uh, observing. That that's right. We yeah. Mind for the uh, yeah. concentration and finally uh, see yeah. uh, true happening. Yeah. That that's exactly. So right. can we use yeah. the mind to solve the problem of the mind? We use this mind to solve the problem because we don't have anything else to use. That's the only thing we have. The mind has to change the mind. And you, you first sit down to meditate and you have no ability to concentrate. But you condition the mind. You're creating the karma to be able to concentrate. That's what you're doing. <laughs> you know, you're conditioning the mind. And the same way with, with dealing with all of the, the negative mental states like anger. So, so which part of, the, of, the, of our mind is actually conscious, uh, aware, um, awareness? How do we define it? It's kind of go to psychological way. Uh, 
Well, it is this, it's this unique aspect of the human mind that we can that we can learn through observation. If we practice mindful awareness, through observation, an impression is made on the mind, which conditions. So it is, it's the faculty of, of mindfulness. And that's why it's so important to develop it and make it strong. But that's also why it's so important that that faculty of mindfulness needs to be turned on the mind itself. We have to have introspective awareness. We have to become aware of what the mind is doing. We practice doing that in meditation because the only way we can condition the mind to develop concentration and mindful awareness is to be aware of what the mind is doing. And so you keep doing that over and over again. You keep coming into a state of being mindfully aware of what the mind is doing. And this conditions you so that you go out in the world and you can become mindfully aware of what the mind is doing. So that instead of something happens, you feel pain, uh, it results in anger, identification of the cause of the pain uh, uh, as the source of your suffering, and then you commit some action in response to that. And that just has the effect of conditioning the same process to happen over again in the future. It reinforces the conditioning that was already there that made it happen. And by just going through the same thing again, the conditioning gets stronger. But if you bring to this mindful awareness, if the conditioning is still very strong, you're not going to change what happens. You 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 experience a painful event, <clears throat> anger arises. You're not going to change that because you're already conditioned to that. But you can be mindful of it. And... Not only that, you can be mindful of the consequences of it. That being angry doesn't help. It doesn't feel good. It does. You know, this this is not serving me to be angry. You may act out of the anger if the conditioning is strong enough. Even though you have mindful awareness, you'll still act out of the anger. But if you are mindful of acting out of the anger and seeing that the consequences of acting out of the anger only make everything worse, then you further condition the mind. So, in this way, the next, in the next circumstance like that, the conditioning, is, the conditioning for the unwholesome action is weakened. Also, the conditioning for the anger to arise as a reaction is also weakened. The cumulative effect over time is that you'll come to a point where you don't react with anger anymore. You become free of anger. So if we totally change our, our uh, habit of our mind, and at that point we don't even have to use awareness anymore. I, I don't think there's ever a point where you don't have to, <laughs> or have to use a, awareness. <laughs> but the, the mindful awareness becomes, becomes very uh, satisfying, attractive, and habit-forming. And uh, it is the most uh, satisfying state in which to to be is to sustain as much mindful awareness as as you can. And here we liberate. Hmm? And here we liberate. And which? And here we are liberated. Yeah. So the um, more piercing, uh, the the um, the the stronger the mindfulness, mm-hmm. the 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 stronger the curvature of change will be towards wholesome. The, the, stronger the, the, the stronger the mindfulness, the more you maximize the, the impact of the observation. Because you see, that's what we often do, is we don't, uh, you know, we are aware that we're doing something that is not beneficial to us, but rather than observing it clearly, because we don't like the idea of ourselves as somebody who does this, we push it out of our awareness and we lose the opportunity. So the stronger the mindfulness, the, the, the deeper the conditioning, the positive conditioning uh, uh, effect will be. I see. That's why it's so important to be honest about our mistakes. And in, in, in through perfection, you said uh, by perfecting virtue, 
that's the path to liberation. That's right. Um, how is perfecting? I, 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 you know, that's a very, very appealing idea. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, I'd like to know the reason behind it. If, 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 if you, if you think it's, it's worthwhile. Yeah. About. Well, there's a, a limited amount of time tonight to okay. take up such a large topic, okay. but just in brief. The perfection of virtue is uh, the practicing of this kind of mindfulness. And it, it, it is the conditioning of your mind stream so that negative mental states, uh, uh, desire and aversion, uh, are, oh, are overcome. Okay. And not only that, if you, if, if you continue in the perfecting of your virtue, you, become, you go beyond just the not doing to actually replacing the negative mental states with the positive mental states. Okay? And so, uh, you, you condition your mind through the perfection of virtue. Now, in terms of liberation, uh, the more that you do this, the closer you come... <laughs> the close, thank you very much. The closer you will come... <laughs> To the circumstances and the event, which is liberating. What's keeping you? What's keeping you from waking up? What's keeping you trapped in this uh, way of experiencing things? Is the uh, the force of ignorance, which is overcome by mindful awareness, and the force of desire and aversion, because. Um, well, just briefly, if I can, I don't know if I can take such a, a deep subject briefly, but... You can't just ignore my question, I'm sorry. I think, I'm taking up a lot of... Well, I, I, perhaps we can come back to, to this uh, tomorrow night, I don't know. But just what, what this brings us to is the process of what's called dependent origination. It's what keeps happening over and over again. It's the way the mind keeps creating the world and the sense of self in such a way that we stay perpetually trapped in, in this way of being and experiencing. Uh, so that's what we need to talk about is dependent or origination because to become enlightened means to have the experience of breaking the chain of dependent origination at the link between uh, the, the, you know, after a sensual experience with a feeling, there arises craving, and out of that craving arises grasping. And it's breaking the link of craving that causes the mind to stop creating the illusion. And when it stops, in that gap, you experience nirvana. You experience the true nature of reality. <clears throat> you then, and all of this stuff that has been intellectually understood and theoretically understood becomes actually realized. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. Anyway, in the last couple of minutes remaining, I want to go back to the very first thing that we were talking about, or well, <laughs> nearly the first thing and that's uh, the the fact that the world that you personally live in is that's the creation of your own mind so for better or for worse for good or bad it's the creation of your mind and how what is it that determines what kind of world your mind is going to create it's this karmic conditioning of your mind. So, what we just finished talking about a few minutes ago, the, the way that, the, what we do is a result of our conditioning and what we experience is a result of our conditioning. The mental formations determine the world that you, your mind creates for you, moment by moment by moment. And if the world your mind is creating for you, moment by moment by moment, isn't the way you want it to be, you have to understand 
how it is that the mind creates it in that particular way. Well, it creates it in that particular way because of this accumulated conditioning and the unwholesome mental states and the uh, negative actions and, and everything else that you've done that's reinforced that conditioning is in the past that's what's causing your mind to create the world the way it is in the present for better or for worse shh <laughs> 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 yeah. no it wasn't working earlier did it? <laughs> uh, yeah for better or for worse but and until your until the world that your mind is creating for you is perfect, uh, there's always a potential to improve it, right? <laughs> so, anyway, that that's <clears throat> that's emptiness, emptiness of self. This idea of who you are and the emptiness of the world that you find yourself. The emptiness means that they aren't that way. Your, your self isn't a self-existent, permanent, unchanging entity that is a particular way. And the world is not uh, the way it appears to be. Both are empty in the sense that both are creations of the mind. Both are projections of the mind. And these projections, the projection of self and the projection of the world, the way you perceive it, are both the result of karmic conditioning. And you have control over the karmic conditioning in the future. The past you can't change. But the present is when the karma of the future is being created. Mindful awareness is the tool that... Mindful awareness is the tool by which you change your karmic conditioning in the present so that the world your mind creates in the future can be different. And this is the path to liberation. That's the past. So, so could you advise us uh, in a very simple sentence that uh, advise, advise us that uh, how, based on what we should make all our you know, lifelong you know, choice, all kind of choice, I mean, if you could? Uh, purify your virtue. And by that, or I, another way I could put it would be a, a, a better way, practice the six paramitas, the six perfections, because that includes purifying your virtue together with explicitly identifying the practice of generosity and patience and meditation uh, and uh, developing wisdom. Um, but if I say purify, specifically understand that the root cause of uh, all unhappy conditions is desire, aversion, and ignorance. If you keep that one thing in mind and understand it more and more deeply, mindfulness is the antidote to ignorance. And through mindfulness, uh, you can overcome desire and aversion. So desire, aversion, and ignorance, they're, they're, they're right at the root of everything. And that's what you want to change. The other things I said still apply. Practice the six paramitas, uh, which means that you, as you overcome desire, you replace it with generosity. As you overcome ill will, you uh, replace it with loving kindness, uh, and ignorance is replaced with mindful awareness. Loving kindness and compassion, mindful awareness, understanding, wisdom. Actually, I shouldn't say ignorance is replaced by mindful awareness. Ignorance is replaced by wisdom. You, you, you develop wisdom. So, so before we make a decision, we should we should examine all the conditions, see if it fit the virtual part. Yes, before you, before you you could that would be a very simple way to. I mean, it's, it's much easier to say than it is to do, 
and we can talk about ways of doing it, but uh, before you commit any act, if you can determine what the intentions are behind that act, is the act arising out of desire uh, or aversion, then it's not a good act. If it's arising out of generosity, loving kindness and compassion, it is. And if you're not sure, the other things that you can look at, is this action going to produce a beneficial effect for others and on my future self? I mean, uh, uh, or, or is it going to produce a, a harmful effect? If it's going to produce a harmful effect, it's not, it's not a good act. If it's going to produce a beneficial effect, it is. And I say, you, not just others, but also yourself, because this is one of the things we do. We treat our, the, our, our self that's going to exist tomorrow as if it were a stranger. And we do things that cause harm to our future self. We can also do things that benefit our future self. Right? So, do things that benefit others and to benefit your future self. Especially to benefit your future self in terms of your own liberation. But see, these are the key things, the roots uh, of desire, aversion, and ignorance. To the degree that they're pre present uh, and to the degree that you can recognize them, then uh, you will know better what to do. So you mean uh, it doesn't matter what kind of decision we need to uh, make, that we can always break down that thing to the, to the very root that you can yes. really see. If, if, you can take it to the, if you can take it down to that root, you can see very clearly. Not so easy to do, though. Your mind plays many, many tricks. Your mind will, will uh, come up with... All know, kind of... Reason. That's right. You're, you're, something's really coming out of uh, desire and greed, and your mind can come up with a lot of rationalizations. Wow, this is really generosity. <laughs> this is really compassion. Yeah, I'm, I'm eating the last piece of cheesecake so you won't gain weight. <laughs> you know, your mind can be very, very tricky. So. Um, you have to be very, very honest. You have to be very, very honest. That's right. Honest is a really, really under, under that's, that's right. virtue. Yes. <laughs> and and you, you, have to, you have to be very, very honest, and you have to keep, you know, always looking a little closer and looking a little deeper, and reflect backwards and see, you know, I mean, sometimes it seems one way when you're doing it, but you can look back at it and see it more clearly than you did at the time, so... Re reflection. Uh, look back. Or? Reflect. To re remember. When you're, you know, if you do something right now, it may seem uh, perfectly wholesome. But if you look at it tomorrow, if it wasn't, it may be easier to see that it. Oh, wasn't. you mean just jump out? Maybe jump to the future. And try to look back. No. When the future arrives, uh, what I'm saying is reflect on the things that you've done. It's good to, if you want to. If you want to uh, overcome a particular mental state, uh, say uh, uh, irritability, if you're very prone to irritability and you want to overcome that, look back over the last day and you'll find all the times that you were irritable that you didn't notice at the time or that you rationalized uh, away from noticing. Do you want to see all those times that you... If you want to overcome acting out of desire, make sure that you reflect, that you look backwards and at the end of the day, you reflect over the day because you'll be able to see... In the evening, you'll be able to see the times that desire was present that at the time you couldn't see. Oh, he was blinded. You're blinded in the moment. You're blinded by the intensity of the mental states that are present. When you have a strong state of desire present, it's very hard to see the desire. <laughs> oh. But what if the decision needs to be made in the morning? 
Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a modification of behavior. It's, it's, like it's, it's, it's never, it's never too late. I, I, because, well, the thing is that if you couldn't see it at the time, you couldn't see it at the time. You know, so unless you have a time machine, <laughs> what's done is done. But the whole point is that you can enjoy all the benefits of mindfulness. You know, looking back. You can look tonight, you can look back at what you did this morning, and you can see the cause. It arose out of one of these unwholesome roots. You can see the mental state that arose. You can see the consequences. You you can practice mindfulness after the event. And it's not, and and that's the thing about it that uh, uh, you don't need to judge yourself. And you don't need to blame yourself. You, you can recognize that uh, it is your past conditioning. So when you look back and say, you know, oh, look what I did, don't beat yourself up about it. Instead, practice mindfulness. Take the opportunity to practice mindfulness of, of the causes and the acts and the consequences so that you will condition your mind not to do it in the future. So... Great. Thank you. <laughs> you just made me, you, you just helped me make my decision. <laughs> oh, good. See, that's why, that's why the Buddha always uh, recommended, uh, you know, good, good companions, because if you're in, in the companionship of, uh, uh, of people who uh, communicate virtuous ideas to you, then that helps to condition your mind towards uh, good decisions as well. So I don't know what decision you made, but I'm <laughs> so glad that I see you made the right choice to be here so that you could hear this, but you didn't. You, you know. Well, the problem. I mean, how how did you do it? <laughs> problem with being the best companion is everybody wants a piece of you. <laughs> well, and. That's better than the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Try to like hog your, hog your attention, yeah. try to ask, ask questions. <laughs> anyway, uh, we'll see where this goes tomorrow. I, I guess uh, uh, tomorrow will be the last Dharma talk. Uh, not it, for me, because I signed up for the session. Yes, yes. <laughs> Why the session? Very so, smart for this session. <laughs> So, so left, uh, left up to me tomorrow, I would probably sort of continue this theme and take it into uh, a discussion of uh, uh, dependent origination and how that fits into this. But that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. So when we start tomorrow, you know, I'll, I'll first invite any of you who have something else, that, somewhere else that you'd rather see this go. Okay? But uh, that's what my inclination is. Okay? All right. So, you have a wonderful, restful night. I'm sorry I robbed you of uh, not only your last meditation, but also... It's not, it's not done. Please, oh, okay. please don't say that. We robbed you. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, you increase the top uh, to double the length. <laughs> and we still don't get enough. <laughs>